Thank you, Marilyn and Judy. And thank you, Blake, for filling in today. You did a great job. We appreciate you. Tim and Darlene are worshiping on a cruise ship. I guess that's all right. Is that all right? If we were with them. They are taking some well-deserved time off, and uh, we'll miss them, but we appreciate those who stand in for them. How can you tell when somebody is teaching you what's right from Scripture? How do you know that a Bible teacher or a preacher is being faithful to God's Word? I'm sure all of you have noticed that people don't always agree on what the Bible is saying. Uh, especially on any particular passage, there may be different ideas, and sometimes they are uh, far apart. And so we ask ourselves the question, does that mean that the Bible is unclear? The answer to that is no. The Bible is not unclear. There are parts that are difficult to understand, that require a little bit more effort. And in fact, to understand the Bible, we need God's Spirit in our life, and so we have to factor that in as well. Uh, but some people are simply wrong uh, in their assertions about Scripture. We live in a time but that's, that's not kind to say. It's not politically correct to say. We're supposed to, it, we're supposed to listen to everybody's opinion, value what everyone has to say, and uh, not tell anybody that they're wrong. But that, I hope you realize, is a dangerous position. Everybody can't be right. Some people are wrong sometimes. Uh, and particularly dealing with God's Word, we want to make sure that we're getting the message uh, of what the Word says. Now, we've already uh, spent some time on this series. If you've got an outline there in front of you, some of that's already filled in. So we'll just recap here and kind of get caught up with where we are. We're using Genesis 25 as our teaching text, one that we looked at a few Sunday mornings ago, Genesis 25, 19 through 34. The first few verses of that tell about how... Um, Isaac got married, and he didn't. Uh, he and his wife did not have a baby for a while. They got concerned about that, and so he prayed. Finally, she got pregnant, and when she did, the babies uh, fought with each other in her womb, which surprised her, and she went and asked the Lord what was happening, and he told her, two nations are in your womb, and gave, them a, uh, gave her a, a prophecy about those two boys that she was going to have. Now, uh, at that point, we stopped and said, number one, the principal type of literature in the Bible is narrative. And that's important to remember. The Bible is an account of historical, uh, uh, historical episodes. Those historical episodes, which have been uh, selected to be recorded in the Bible, reflect the unfolding act of God's redemptive work in history for his people. Now, all of that that I just said, there's a lot of theology in there, but it's very important for us to understand that the, the essential nature of the Bible is a story. Not a story as in a myth or a once upon a time story, but a story as in these are things that happened and this is how they happened. Obviously, anytime we tell a story, it's selective. When you tell a story, uh, you select certain things. You may only remember certain things, but you don't tell every detail that went up that happened. If you did, the story would be laborious uh, if you told every detail, the every color of every piece of clothing that everybody was wearing, and everything that everybody said, everybody did. It, you would get lost uh, in all of the details and you would miss the point of the story. And that's an important thing to keep in mind about the narratives of Scripture. Our minds wander away so easily and we start asking questions. Well, I wonder, what about this? Or what about that? Or why didn't the text answer this question or that question? And we very easily get distracted from the main point of the text. And if you're listening to a Bible teacher and the things that he's teaching or she is teaching are things that you're wondering, you're looking at the text. And by the way, when you're listening to somebody teach the Bible, you should have in your hands what? The Bible. The Bible. Absolutely. Uh, the Bible should be in your hands and you should be following the text, making sure that the person teaching is actually reading from the Bible and that the things that they're talking about and expounding on come logically from the words that are there in front of you. When we first put these screens up for about one Sunday, 
I toyed with the idea of putting, putting the biblical text up so that everyone could read it uh, and as well as the other stuff that we put up. But I very quickly decided against that. Why is that? I want Because I immediately realized that if I started to do that, you would stop bringing what to church? You would, maybe not, but there was a chance that you would stop bringing your Bible to church because you can just sit there uh, and read it. I didn't want that to happen. I wanted you to open your Bible and hold it in your hand and to look at the text and read along with me and your Sunday school teacher and whoever else is standing up here and actually think about what is being said and ask yourself the question, is the teacher telling me things that come from this text or has he or she just gotten off in left field somewhere and I, I don't even know where they are anymore. Uh, and one of, the mo one of the most fundamental questions that you can ask about a Bible teacher is, if I listen to that person over and over again, am I getting the story of the Bible? The beginning, the middle, and the end. That God made the world, that he put Adam and Eve in it, that they sinned, and that God spent generations preparing for a Savior who would then die on the cross to redeem God's people and that he's coming back again to consummate this age uh, and his kingdom. That's the basic the sweeping panorama of scripture. Uh, uh, are the good Bible teachers are always going to bring us back to that. And the more you listen to somebody that's teaching the Bible well, the more you're comfortable with that, that big macro um, uh, narrative uh, of the Bible. Now, uh, in the next few verses of our text, the, uh, uh, it says that Rebecca gave birth to twins and tells us that one was red and hairy and came out first, the next one came out hanging on to his, uh, his brother's heel, and that's Esau uh, and Jacob. And at that point, we stopped and I uh, introduced to you number two on your outline, which is this. Biblical narratives usually have a problem, solution, response progression. And we spent some time on that last Sunday night. We had a really good time together. When you're studying a Bible narrative, as you read it, you begin to ask yourself, what is the problem that's being presented in this text? We had a great example of feeding the 5,000 that noted that it's easy to get distracted by the physical need of the bread and miss the spiritual meaning of that text. The spiritual, there was a physical problem. The people did need to be fed physically, but there was a deeper or higher uh, meaning that was really the, the true problem, which is that the people were like sheep without a shepherd. Now that's a good example of how the teaching comes directly from the text because it says specifically that Jesus, when he saw the people, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. The, the narrative with the big N, God, as he writes the details of the text, gives us these things. If it's not in the text, then it's not the answer. Okay? Just remember that. If you can't find it in the text, it can't possibly be the answer. It will be in there. The details that God has selectively made sure were recorded will have the essential information that we need to get out of that text. And so usually in a narrative, or always in a narrative, there's a problem presented, there's a solution presented. Now sometimes the solution is not worked out. And the classic example of Jonah is the book of Jonah. That book just leaves us hanging. And there are other examples as well. But when you're reading a narrative, ask yourself, what's the problem? What's the solution? And usually there's some kind of response. Then we went on with Genesis 25. Um, Esau and Jacob grow up. Esau's a hunter. He likes to be outdoors. Jacob is, likes to stay indoors. And Esau comes home one day after hunting, and he failed, and he's hungry. And Jacob has cooked some lentil stew. And we've talked a lot about that lentil stew. And uh, Esau traded away his birthright to eat some of that stew. And uh, it tells us at the end of that that, well, let me just back up. That's a little section of text where another interesting thing happens. And you'll notice this as you study your Bible. Always remember that the main character of every Bible story is who? God. Always. Even when he's not what? When he's not mentioned. If he's not mentioned, he's still there. Uh, and here's a little section where God is not mentioned. There's an entire book in the Bible where God is not mentioned, the book of Esther. But God is still always the main player. He's always the main character. He's always there behind the scenes uh, and controlling events. So number three, I told you the main character in Bible narratives, whether mentioned or not, 
is always God. That's a good thing to remember because as we're asking ourselves what a text means, we should ask this question. What does this text tell me about God? What does this text tell me about God? If you're listening to a Bible teacher over a period of time, you should be learning more things about God. If you're just learning about psychology and science and the state of the world and how to do better on your job and be a better spouse and all these things, it may all be very valuable uh, and useful information, but it's missing the main point of the Bible, which is we want to know more about God. Two things about God. We want to know who He is, what His personality is, what His proclivities are, what is He like, what, is he, what types of things does He do and not do. And we want to know what is His plan. What is the plan that He's implementing, that He's working out in history so that I can recognize that plan and be a part of it. The two things we want to know about God, His personality and His plan. His personality and His plan. And every text in the Bible will reveal something about God's personality or His plan or both of them. And so that's one of the questions that we want to ask ourselves. But notice at the end of verse 34 of Genesis 25, something very unusual happens. I've mentioned this to you. Very rarely does the narrator in the Old Testament give us, spoon feed us, the actual meaning of a particular text. Usually, we are required to work for it. This is an unusual narrative because the narrator tells us, so Esau despised his birthright. He spoon feeds us. And the reason I said for that is because there are so many possible meanings in this text. We could look at Isaac and see his failure. We could look at Rebecca and see her failure. We could look at Jacob and see his failure. Or we could look at Esau and see, see his failure. We could end up with four Bible lessons out of this one text. And that wouldn't necessarily be bad, but we want to make sure that we get the one that God really wanted us to get. And so he gives it to us at the end here. He says, "What the person that I really want you to see here is Esau. His failure is the one that I want you to take to heart. Uh, and so he says that Esau despised his birthright. We always want to look for the narrator's clues about the meaning of the text. Even though they may be sparse, sometimes they, sh they show up. But let me ask you a question. Why doesn't God just always tell us what the meaning of the text At the end of every narrative, why doesn't he just say, and the, and the lesson of this text is X, Y, and Z? Why doesn't he do that? It would be a quick study. Is that bad? Why is that, Jay? But if he's already told you what it is, then what's the point of having to pour over it? There's no need to read it. Well, if he's going to tell you what the meaning is, why worry about it? If we don't work for it, it might not mean as much to us. Kathleen? We put it more, maybe as an example, how to live and all, if we have to dig for the meaning. You know. Kind of the same thing that Kay is saying, yeah. More ownership in the text, yeah. There could be more than one meaning. We have to be real careful with that. There could be more than one um, application. That's right. Let, let's talk about that for a minute because Kevin brings up a very, very interesting point. Uh, the text has a meaning. And it's possible that a particular text may have a couple of meanings. But that's where we need to be real careful because the text has been given us to us by God with a particular meaning. We can't just read anything into it that we want to. I'm going to say it this way, Kevin, and you can argue with me later if you want to. I'd love to. But I'm going to change your words just a little bit. Every biblical text has one meaning with multiple possible applications. One meaning with maybe several potential applications. Pardon me? Now you're asking an interesting <laughs> question. Prophecies sometimes are fulfilled in multiple ways. That's true. And we're talking right now specifically about narrative. 
So, but Kevin said, he said, even prophecy. And it is true that some prophecies are fulfilled multiple times. Can anybody think of one? There's a real big one in the Bible. It's so big you'll never think of it. It's too simple. Jesus. The Old Testament tells us that the Messiah is coming. It turns out what? He comes that the Messiah comes twice. That's exactly right. And so the further back we get in time, the more general prophecies tend to be. As we get closer, we see more potential applications for those things. Uh, and that's, that's a special area of Bible study itself. Prophecies can have more than one fulfillment, but I would even argue with you there, and Kevin say that they still have one meaning, even though they have more than one fulfillment. So it's almost the same thing as saying one meaning and multiple applications. Kind of a semantic argument there more than anything else. Okay? That's, in, that's exactly, I hope everybody's experienced that, where you read a text that maybe you've read all your life and it seems to have a new meaning to you, probably if you stop and think about it, it's not a new meaning. It's the same meaning that it's always had. It's just unfolding itself and you're understanding it better. The light bulb comes on. The light bulb comes on, yeah. And some of us have multiple light bulbs. They're little bitty ones, you know, and slowly the light gets bigger. Uh, and so it's a new application, it's a new, uh, the, the danger, let me tell you why I'm, I'm hedging a little bit here. The danger of saying that a particular text may have multiple meanings is to say that the meaning of the Bible has to do with us in our circumstance, in our situation, that we drive the meaning of the Bible. So whatever we come to the Bible with, and I know this isn't what you're saying by it, but I want you to understand why I, I'm concerned about those words. Because over the last few decades, as belief in the Bible has, has been watered down in our culture, especially in the West, something called reader response and some other things have come up where people have said, the Bible is really what you make it. The Bible is what you bring to it. So it could be different tomorrow than what it is today, and it may be different today from what it is yesterday. And I would put the brakes on there and say, no, that's going way too far with that kind of thinking. The Bible is established, and it has an established meaning that God meant for us to get when he wrote it. Now, as we go along and we understand it more, there may be multiple applications. Yes, sir. I agree. There are primary and secondary meanings, yes. Applications. Yeah. important for us to be able to distinguish between primary and secondary. A lot of times devotionals will be on a secondary meaning of a text, but the main teaching needs to be on uh, the primary meaning of the text. But you finally answered, the, you gave the answer in your, what you just said that I was looking for. Why does God make us work so hard to get the meaning out of the text so often? And Kevin said he wants us to seek him. Spending time in the Bible is spending time with God. That's one of the primary places that we meet with God is in Scripture. And so as believers, and with God's Spirit in our heart, we should actually have a desire to want to spend time in the Bible. Now don't feel bad. I know you struggle. We all struggle with it from time to time. Our moods change, and there are particular parts of Scripture are, are more difficult for us. Uh, but in, in the end of the day, the reason that God wants us to work uh, is so that we'll spend time with Him and his spirit. Sometimes we just need to, we need to wait long enough. If you're like me, you don't like waiting, uh, but we got to wait on the Lord. 
Uh, and uh, one of the things that Jesus did in his teaching is he threw up a barrier of parables. And people who were not willing to work through that barrier, they were just left on the outside. And he admitted to his disciples that's exactly what he was doing. He said, I'm throwing up. He didn't use these words, but he said, you're on the inside. You get the meaning because you pushed forward. You asked. They came up. They didn't understand the parables any better than anyone else when they first heard them. And they came up to him and they said, what are you doing? What, what is all this about throwing seed on the ground? What in the world's going on? Because you read the Sermon on the Mountain, it's just plain as day. He just laid it out there. But then suddenly he switches gears and he begins to tell these parables without describing what the meaning is. And if nobody asked him what the meaning was, do you know what Jesus did? He walked away. That's stunning, isn't it? it, it he was saying, there's nobody here, apparently, who wants to press in and find out what the meaning is. So I'll go to the next town and see if there's some people there who want to press forward. Uh, and get to me. Now, anybody, anybody who came up and said, what in the world are you talking about? What would he do? He would tell them. You're willing to press in? I'll give you the answer. You're an insider, and you get the mystery of the kingdom of God, the mystery of the kingdom of heaven. And so when we come to the Bible, it shouldn't surprise us sometimes if it seems like there's sort of a deflector shield on it. For those who aren't willing to really press forward, they sort of get deflected off of it. I don't understand. I don't get it. It must not mean anything. And they go on. And they're, they're, they end up staying on the outside. We should be wise enough to realize I'm going to push forward, forward and spend a little bit of time and let God speak to my heart. Now, the key issue there is, I just said it, it starts with a T. What is it? Time. And, you know, if you want to sit down in the morning and say, okay, God, I've got five minutes. Hit me with it. Guess what? We're on the outside. We're going to stay on the outside. Uh, not that five minutes in the Word can't do you some good, but don't expect some big revelation in five minutes. How long do you think it took John on the island of Patmos to get the, the book of Revelation? You know that book is not revelations. You realize that, right? It's not plural. It's singular. That's all one Revelation. That's an amazing revelation, isn't it? Yeah, I wonder what would have happened it had John said, you know what, Lord, I've got an appointment. Can, you, can we start this back up later? Uh, when God is doing something, everything else stops. He knows what's going on in our life. He knows what's important. And if, if he's ready to talk to us, that's where we stop. And we listen to him uh, and get the meaning of that text. Number four, always let the narrator determine the meaning of Bible narratives. Always let the narrator determine the meaning of Bible narratives. We could probably continue to argue this point, uh, and some of you might not understand why I'm so adamant about it. But uh, let me just say this. We don't determine the meaning of the Bible. We don't. <coughs> We, we, we never do. And I know you don't think that. But we don't want to get, we don't want to even leave that impression with someone else. We come to the Bible to hear the voice of God and to hear what He wants to say to us and to understand what He wants to say to us on every level. It's not always an easy thing to do. Now, uh, we uh, ask this question. We've looked through this, this narrative here of Esau and Jacob. These two boys that are born they grow up different, and uh, at one point in their life, when they're adults, young adults, Esau despises his birthright. Is there more that we can get out of that story from Scripture? The answer is yes. When we, when we look at the narratives in the Old Testament, we can. The next thing that we can do is begin to look forward in the Bible for further revelation on those particular episodes that help us understand the meaning of that text. Now, it's occurring to me that what I'm about to do it may make it sound like I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth because I'm going to show you that this text is handled in two different ways in the New Testament. But let's go through this and you tell me what you think, okay? Um, the first place we look, the first thing that we want to do when we look at a text after we've spent time in the text, start with the text, 
Look at what comes before it, look what comes after it, and then what do we do? Somebody want to guess? What's the next thing that you can do to study a Bible text? Who knows? Tommy? That's a good thing to do. Yeah. Pick out a situation or word and do what with it? What's that, then? Yes, that's it. That's it. Most Bibles nowadays have a concordance in the, in the back of them. Uh, and you don't even need a printed concordance anymore because our computers have great concordances on them. And you can just type a word in uh, and see where else it occurs in the Bible. Now, sometimes that's a problem. What's that? Yeah, that's another issue. We'll talk about that sometime. We've talked about that in here. He mentioned something called the rule of first mention. Uh, and I'm not sure if that's a real rule or not. It's an interesting subject. Um, but let's look at this, our story here. If we went to the, if we went to the concordance to type something in, sometimes it can be a problem. If we're studying Moses and we type in Moses, get what? Guess what? <laughs> Whoa, that's going to be a problem. You know, uh, we, we, we may need to pick another word. If you want to study what the Bible says about love, and you type in the word love, guess what's going to happen? That's going to be a problem. Yeah. You, you, if, you, if you're going to write an article about what the Bible says about love, then you better block out about three or four years uh, of your life. So you, you kind of have to play a word game here with concordances to find something that's manageable. In this particular text, what would you type in uh, to look up to try to find other Bible verses? Esau would be what I would write. A birthright would be uh, a good one. Can you think of another one? Probably doesn't. That's good enough. Because remember, the narrator has given us the, the answer to what this text means in this particular case. And if we looked up Esau, we would end up going to the prophets that Kevin reminded us of. That very, for us, such a difficult part of the Bible. But if we need to get into the prophets, we need to spend time in them because we really can learn a lot of good things from the prophets, even though there's a lot in the prophecies that we don't understand. Let me give you a, a little piece of advice for reading the, the prophets, because I know they're hard to read. When you get into a section where there's a lot of names, people's names, place names, and things like that, and you're thinking, I am not getting any of this at all. I just, I don't know what, what in the world Jeremiah's talking about, or what in the world Isaiah's talking about. Uh, this isn't my favorite piece of advice, but I'll give it to you. Okay? Scan ahead. Scan ahead until you find something that you can understand and read that. Now, that's my B advice. All right? My A advice, what I'd really like for you to do, is go to some other tool like a uh, Bible handbook or uh, an article about the, the uh, particular book that you're reading, like Jeremiah, and read somebody who understands that book and find out what in the world is this guy talking about. And if you were to read about Jeremiah, for instance, he would tell you, well, Jeremiah's prophesying to God's people right before Nebuchadnezzar came in and destroyed him. He would give you some background and go, okay, now I'm beginning to see a little bit about what's, what's going on here. Sometimes just a few sentences can help you see why they're saying some of the things that they're saying. Then you can go back and read and start to make more sense. Uh, and there are a lot of prophecies, uh, a lot of prophets in the Old Testament, major and minor prophets. If we know a little bit about the background of each one, it helps us. Now, when we do Esau, we're going to come to Malachi. Uh, because pro uh, Esau's name comes up in Malachi chapter 1. Can you find Malachi in your book? What is unique about the book of Malachi? It is what? The last book of the Old Testament. It's the last book in the Old Testament. How many of you can list your 12 minor prophets? I won't ask you to do that. <laughs> If you had to do that before eating supper, how many of you would go to bed hungry? <laughs> uh, Malachi. Look up Malachi chapter 1. And it comes very, very early in the book. Here's what the NIV says. An oracle, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. Do you notice that? Not a word of the Lord to Malachi, but a word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, the Lord says? Yet I have loved Jacob. But Esau, I have. Uh-oh. That doesn't look right. Let's back up. Who's talking? 
God. He loved Jacob. We like that. That's good. But then we get to Esau and it says what? Does God hate? It, according to this verse, he does. This is a really troubling verse to a lot of people, but Esau I have hated. And I have turned his mountain land and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Hmm. Well, first of all, we might want to know a little bit about what's going on in Malachi. Does anybody know what the background of Malachi is? No Bible scholars, or at least no willing Bible scholars. Thumbnail sketch. Malachi is prophesying God's people after they've returned from exile. Remember, their idolatry was so persistent that eventually God destroyed Jerusalem, destroyed the temple, and they went to Babylon for 70 years. A remnant returned. Only 40,000 out of who knows how many that went to Babylon. The rest of them stayed in Babylon. And when they came back, it was not easy. Jerusalem was destroyed. The walls were broken down. All their houses were gone. The temple was destroyed. Uh, and they really struggled. And Malachi, God sent Malachi and some others to encourage them to rebuild the temple. To re Nehemiah came, remember, and helped them rebuild the walls. And Ezra came and helped them to rebuild their spiritual lives because they were just in disarray. It was horrible. It was a bad time uh, for Israel. And Malachi is talking to a people who is beaten down. They don't think that God cares about them anymore. They think that God's given up, then we'll give up too. Who cares? Uh, the economy is destroyed. Nothing is working right. The crops aren't growing. Uh, they have these heavy taxes to pay to the Babylonians. And uh, they, they don't want to tithe anymore. Why should we give our money to God? What has He done for us? They don't want to worship. When they do bring a sacrifice, instead of bringing a, a sacrifice that is the best that they have to offer, it's left over because their hearts are just not in it. And Malachi comes and he begins to minister to them. And he brings up Jacob and Esau, and he's, he goes right to the heart of the issue. They don't think God loves them anymore. And he brings up these two brothers, and he says, I loved Jacob, but I hated Esau. Now, what in the world is he talking about? First of all, we have this issue of hate in God. Uh, and that's a strong word, and we teach our children not to use it a lot of times because we don't... We say, well, we don't hate anyone. And so why is the word used here? And one thing that we could do is go back to our what? Our concordance and type in what? The word hate. And we could say, well, how does the Bible use the word hate? Uh, maybe the Bible's using the word a little bit differently from the way that I use it. And interestingly enough, we would find two texts that might help us a little bit. This isn't going to be a lesson on hate, so I'm not going to answer all your questions about it, but I'll give you something. In the New Testament, we find that Jesus said this, If anyone comes to me and does not, what? His father and mother? Hate. His father and mother. His wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own wife. He cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, this is where cross-references help us understand the Bible. The more we cross-reference, the more we let the Bible interpret the Bible, the better we are at understanding the Bible. If we kept studying, then we would go to Matthew and we would hear Jesus say almost exactly the same thing. By the way, one of the reasons that the disciples remember Jesus' teaching is because they heard it was. Jesus went from town to town to town. You think he taught all new stuff every time he came to a new town? Absolutely not. Uh, they heard something like the so-called Sermon on the Mount. There's no telling how many times they heard something close to the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, or any of these teachings, take up your cross and follow me and so forth. They heard him teach those things over and over again. And apparently sometimes the words were not exactly the same. Because in Matthew it says this, Anyone who loves his father or mother more than me is not worthy. Of me. Anyone who loves a son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And anyone who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Now, obviously, it's the same teaching. The words are slightly different. Is it because Matthew and Mark got it wrong? No. 
they got it right. It's because Jesus didn't say exactly the same thing every time. Just like when we tell the same story, we're going to use exactly the same words, but it has the same meaning. It has the same meaning. And that's why the words are slightly different in Luke and in Matthew. But notice he uses hate in Luke, but he uses love less in Matthew. So that gives us a clue that Jesus may use hate as sort of a hyperbole sometimes. That this bothers people. Jesus used hyperbole. The Bible uses hyperbole. The Bible uses human language exactly the same way that we use human language. Sometimes there's figures of speech. Sometimes there's not. That's part of understanding Scripture is to understand what type of literature we're dealing with. As Kevin mentioned before, when we're dealing with prophecy, we deal with it a particular way. When we're dealing with Proverbs, we deal with those a particular way. When we deal with a narrative, we deal with it a particular way. Narrative is not a prophecy, is not a proverb. There, there are different types of literature. We understand that. When we pick the newspaper up and read it, we know that on the front page it tells us certain kinds of things, and on the funny page it tells us certain kind of things. On the opinion page, it tells us certain kind of things. We don't understand the front page, the funny page, and the opinion page exactly the same way. And, and the Bible is the same way too. It has different genres or types of literature, and we want to handle them uh, properly. So Malachi, what he is doing here is he's using Jacob and Esau as representatives for their people. Now, I'll just give you the answer. I'd like to walk through with you, uh, but I don't have time. I'll just give you the answer to what Malachi is doing here. He's reminding the people of Israel, I chose you out of all the peoples of the earth. Like Esau and the Edomites, I didn't choose them. I chose you. That's why you know that I love you. And they're looking at their surroundings and they're thinking to themselves, we're chosen? Look at what we're living in. Our, our city has been destroyed. We just got back from exile. Everybody else is having a good time and here we are struggling. And you're telling us that you love us? And he says, yes. Yes. <coughs> Sometimes the people whom God loves that he chooses are the ones who what the most? Suffer the most. That's a tough thing to realize about God. And it really is out of step with a lot of Bible teachers today. But I can prove it to you from page after page after page after page, chapter after chapter, book after book, that sometimes God's people are the ones who what the most? They suffer the most. Why does God make us work so hard to get the meaning out of a text? Because he wants us to what, Kevin? Seek him out. Is that what you said? Why does God make us suffer in this life? Because he wants us to what? He wants us to seek him out. Every time something comes into our life, it's devastating to us and makes us struggle. The first thing that we should think is God is calling me to him. He's drawing me to him. But it's not, is it? The first thing we think is what? Why me? Yeah, why me? Then when God finally gets into our mind, what do we think? Help. Help. Why are you doing this to me, God? You could, you could make this go away. Why are you allowing this to happen? Because he wants us to draw. These 40,000 people who had come back to Jerusalem were the chosen ones. The one who stayed in Babylon with all their great houses and all the money and all their businesses that they had built up and their easy lives. Guess what they just did? They were no different from the rich young ruler. Jesus came to him and he said, if you want to follow me, it's going to cost you. I want you to get rid of everything you have and I want you to come after me. And what did he do? No thanks. Not doing it. And the Spirit of the Lord came to the Israelites, the Jews who were in Babylon. He said, it's time to go back. to Jerusalem. It's time to give all this up and go back. And most of them said what? Ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. We've built our lives here. We're not going back to a charred ruin uh, to live our lives. We're staying right here. But the ones who did go back to that charred ruin, it turns out, had stepped right into the center of the flow of the history of God's redemption. They may not have realized it at the time, but they were literally right at the center of what God was doing. To the world, it looked like they were out on the, that they were off the road of what was happening in history. 
God's people often look like they're out of step with what's happening in history. We are countercultural. We're always moving in a different direction. If we're moving in the same direction as the world, then buzzers and bells should go off and we should say, wait a minute, maybe something's wrong here because Jesus said that the broad road leads to what? And there are how many people on it? But the narrow road leads to what? Life. And there are how many people on it? Few. And those, those people living in those charred ruins, that 40,000 that came back to Jerusalem, they were on the narrow road. But the narrow road's tough, and sometimes we question it, and they did, and so Malachi had to come and talk to them. How does that help us understand Esau? Well, it, Esau actually becomes uh, a teaching of, about God's sovereignty, and it comes out in the book of Romans. Write this down, number five on your outline. Always let the Bible interpret the Bible. Always let the Bible interpret the Bible. Who knows the... Um, Newspaper questions. Who, what, when, where, and why. Those of you who study the Bible, I'd, I'd love to go through an exercise with you on this, but I'm running out of time. So, um, and, and this series ends tonight, by the way. So, <laughs> just write those down. That's a great way to study the Bible. I do that every single week. I've got that on my, my template for Bible study. Who, what, why, when, where. Etc. And I've got several columns. In this story, we could write down Jacob's name and answer those questions. What, when, where, why? Write down Esau's name. Answer those questions. Rebecca's name. Isaac's name. Anybody in the narrative, anybody in the story, you can make a column for them and answer all of those questions. Uh, and it begins to bring out uh, some of what's going on. All right, very quickly, before I run out of time, look at Romans 9, 10. Not only that, but Rebecca's children had one and the same father, our father, Isaac. Yet before the twins were born or had done anything good or bad, in order that God's purpose in election might stand, not by works, but by him who calls, she was told, the older will serve the younger, just as it is written, Jacob I loved, Esau I loved. Now this helps us understand the Malachi passage. What's, what's being talked about here is whether God has chosen somebody or not chosen them. And that's, that's, a, that's a big subject. Background on Romans, this part of Romans. Here's a question. If Jesus fulfilled all of the Old Testament prophecies to the Jews, then why did the Jews, re, re, why did the Jews reject him? If Jesus was the one that God had told the Jewish people about for hundreds of years, shouldn't they have recognized him? Why, why was the... Why was the church in the first century made up of Gentiles? Paul is struggling with this in Romans 9, 10, and 11. And part of the answer he says here is because God sovereignly chooses certain people. Now I know this is, that's another subject. We've talked about it in here and we will again in the future, but we're not going to talk about it tonight. I'm just going to lay it out there. God sovereignly chooses certain people for certain things. Notice I didn't say salvation because that's, that's where we drop off into the pit theologically. But without a doubt, Paul is saying here, the reason that a lot of the Jews have rejected Jesus is because God has sovereignly chosen. He brings up Esau and Jacob as an example. He says, remember Jacob and Esau? They had the same father. The original text uh, in the Greek doesn't necessarily say just the same father. It says the same uh, night that mom and dad were together. There's no difference between these two men. They were conceived in one instant. There's no way for us to tell them apart. And yet God chooses one. And he doesn't choose the other. Oh, that aggravates some people. How can God do that? Well, we're not going to answer the question tonight, but Paul's just saying he doesn't. He's God. He makes choices. He saw them. And he uses... Esau and Jacob, he uses the narrative that we've been looking at to bring out something about God, that God is sovereign and he makes sovereign choices in dealing with peoples. He's really not talking out here, by the way, about Jacob and Esau as much as he's talking about the Israelites and the Gentiles. So he's saying, I chose Israel. Israel is my people. And I will choose the people that I 
Jude. In fact, he goes on in this text to quote the Old Testament that says, I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. What are you going to do about it? What can we do about it? We want his mercy. Now, what Paul is doing here in Romans, I want you to notice, is he's using Jacob and Esau in the um, narrative that we started out with in Genesis 25 to reveal something about God. He's saying that when God chose Jacob over Esau, even though Esau was the oldest, he was exercising his sovereign choice. And this is what I want you to see, that in the Bible, when you're studying a text, you should be able to answer this question. What does this text tell me about God? And the, the Jacob and Esau text tells us something very fundamental about God that we see all across the panorama of the Bible's uh, revelation, Old Testament and New Testament, that God is sovereign and he makes sovereign choices. The, the key choice that he made was that he chose Abraham. He said, you're it. I'm going to choose you and your descendants after you and one of your seed, Jesus, and that's how I'm going to be my, bring my redemption to all the world. That's very politically incorrect for God to choose one people to, choose, to bless the rest. Why can't he just bless them all? Well, that's the way God works. That is his sovereign choice. Here's the next thing on your outline, number six. Ask yourself, what does the text say about God and his plan of salvation? God and his plan of salvation. Actually, we can ask ourselves, too, what does the text say about God and his personality? Because some texts just tell us something about who God is. But usually it's related to his plan of salvation. One other passage of scripture real quickly. Hebrews 12, turn your Bibles over to Hebrews 12 and verse 16. Hebrews is a book written to mostly Jewish Christians who thought Christianity was getting hard and they were thinking about going back to Judaism. Hey, Judaism was a lot easier than this Christianity stuff in the first century. A lot of people got fed to lions. You know, is this really the road that we need to be on? They were asking themselves. And they were thinking about going back. And the writer of Hebrews says, no, Jesus, Jesus is it. Jesus is better than angels. He's better than Moses. The new covenant is better than the old covenant. And he unfolds his argument in one of the greatest theological documents uh, of all time. In fact, the two greatest theological documents probably in the existence are Romans and Hebrews. Uh, the two books that we're looking at very quickly. But in Hebrews 12, verse 16, he says, See that no one is sexually immoral or godless like Esau. Well, here's Esau again. Who for a single meal sold his inheritance rights as the oldest son. And he's telling these Jewish Christians, don't be like Esau and sell the great thing that you have for something that's less. Don't give up Jesus and Christianity for Judaism. If you were to do that, you'd be just like Esau. You would have missed what God is doing. You would have missed the most valuable thing. For us, he would say, don't give up on Jesus and go back to secularism. Don't give up on Jesus and go back. Don't go anywhere else. There is nowhere else to go. You understand that if Judaism is not good enough, then nothing else is. Because the only other thing that has its seal of approval on it other than Christianity is Judaism from the Old Testament. Until Jesus came along to be a Jew was it. That's where God was working. In the narrative of the Old Testament, that's where God is unfolding his act of redemption is through the Jewish people, the descendants of Abraham. Once Jesus comes along, the curtain is thrown back and the Gentiles come in. And so now it's Christianity. It's the Jewish Gentile church, which ends up being mostly Gentile. And there is nothing else. And at that point, the writer of Hebrews eloquently tells us over several chapters that Jesus is better than Judaism. And then if you go back to Judaism, then you've lost what God is doing. And if Judaism isn't good enough, then it doesn't matter what else you choose. It's not good enough. It doesn't matter what it is. And so he sets the standard for all of this age at this point. But he uses Esau as an example here. And Esau becomes iconic for anyone who walks away from the blessing that God offers and takes something that is lesser. Now, it may take a while for this to hit some of you. I don't know. Maybe you're sharper than I am, and it'll come in an instant. It takes me some time. So. If you'll go and take these texts that I just gave you, Genesis 25, Malachi 1, Romans 9, and Hebrews 12. Esau's in every one of them. And you'll realize that something fascinating is happening. First of all, we have a narrative in the Old Testament. It's simply an episode in history that illustrates both something about God and something about humanity. If you want your two meanings, then here they are. 
Romans comes along, Paul comes along, he says, here's what Esau, here's what Esau tells us about God, that God saw. He didn't choose Esau. He chose Jacob. Whether or not we like that, that's part of who God is. And Romans is using Jacob and Esau to reveal that to us. The writer of Hebrews, on the other hand, no slouch theologically. Some people think he was Paul. If he wasn't, he was someone that was his equal. He comes along with the same two men, Esau, same guy, Esau, and he gives us a moral example. And he says, don't be like Esau. Don't sell the most precious thing that God has given you for something that's lesser, no matter how good it is. Like Esau sold his birthright. So here's here are the two things that's iconic in this triangle between the, all of these texts that we just looked at. This text tells us something about God. He is sovereign. He chooses. And some people would say, well, if God is sovereign and we have no choice, then what's the point? Let's go fishing. Because God's just going to choose. But our triangle wouldn't be a triangle, it's just a straight line, it just has two points on it. Now we have to put the third point in. Because every Bible text is going to tell us something about who God is and what He's doing, and it's also going to tell us something about what? How we respond to God. Right or wrong. And Esau becomes an example of somebody who did not respond properly to God. Here's number seven on your outline. Ask yourself this. What does the text say about our response to God and His plan? If you can answer these two questions about a text, then you will have gone a long way down the road. What does it say about God and His plan? And what does it say about our response to God and His plan? To answer those two questions with two concise little statements. And you know what? You're ready to be a Sunday school teacher. You're ready to teach a Sunday school lesson. You're ready to understand the Bible. And you're ready to listen to a Bible teacher and decide, is that teacher teaching you the Bible in a way he or she should be? Let's pray together.